Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. If you like songbirds, why don't you invite them to stay in your garden all season? Today, we're going to talk about bird houses. Also, wild animals can enjoy the vegetables in your garden as much as you do. We'll show you how to use live animal traps. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by Goodwin's Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation. The WKNO Production Fund. The WKNO Endowment Fund. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Debbie Bruce. Ms. Debbie is the owner of Wild Birds Unlimited. And Mr. D is here. Thanks for joining me today. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. Thank you. Miss Debbie, mm -hmm. I see we have birdhouses. So let's talk birdhouses. Well, this is a very fun time of the year. Spring and summer is the time when birds are going to be nesting. Okay. We have a number of birds that actually come all the way from the neotropics and different parts of South America just to come and nest in our area. So cool. we should be very honored mm -hmm. to have them come into our yard. But having said that, some of them are open cup nesters, such as birds that you might see every day, like your cardinal, okay. that would build an open cup nest in a tree or a shrub. Or some of them are cavity nesters. Another bird you're familiar with as a year-round resident would be your chickadee. Mm -hmm. And it would take a birdhouse or an abandoned woodpecker hole in a tree. Okay. But because of urban sprawl and, and <laughs> things such as that, so many of our dead trees have been removed. Mm -hmm. So we can help birds along by placing birdhouses for them. Some birds, believe it or not, build in very peculiar places. We always hear about birds nesting and hanging baskets on a front porch <laughs> yeah. or the wreath on the front door, uh -huh, uh -huh. which uh -huh. changes our routine somewhat for a few weeks. Some of them use unusual nesting material. I've seen a robin's nest lined with milk straws in a schoolyard. Wow. Okay. Yes. <laughs> unusual. Yes. <laughs> um, and you can actually tell who nested in your tree or your shrub or your birdhouse by what materials are used. Okay. Such as if you open a birdhouse after they're finished nesting and you find a very soft cushion of moss filled with some plant down and maybe some animal fur, then it's maybe a chickadee that was nesting in there or a tufted titmouse. So there's things that you can do to help them along. You can hang up a nesting ball. This is cotton. Now all species of birds, each species will use the same type of nesting material. So if you were to hang this up, you'd probably have maybe a chickadee or a finch or a tufted titmouse pull from it. Okay. If you have some pine straw out in your yard, you probably would have if your area has bluebirds, they would like the pine straw or the grasses. But don't put out drier lint because drier lint will disintegrate when the rains come and then okay. the nest will collapse. Another thing that you could do is put out short pieces of string, not long, three inches or less so the little nestlings don't get tangled up in it. Okay. But you can put houses up. <clears throat> Smaller birds are going to use a smaller house with an opening of one and a half inch to one inch. The most common is a one and a half inch opening and that's going to take your chickadees, your tufted titmice, your nuthatch, Carolina wren, uh, downy woodpecker. Some of them, birds, your larger species like your kestrels, your flickers, uh, eastern screech owl, they want a bigger house. <laughs> Uh, with a three inch opening, okay. two and a half to three inches, and of course a larger structure. This house is designed to be mounted on a pole, where some birds like to have their house hung in a tree. Yeah, it's nice, I like that. 
If you're hanging it in a tree, you want to hang it, wedge it in between the branches so it doesn't swing too much in the winds because those eggs are fragile in the house. Now, if you're doing a house such as for a smaller bird, one and a half inch opening and a four by four or a five by five floor space. If you're doing your larger one for let's say your Eastern screech owl, you want an eight by eight floor space and quite a bit taller, a 20 inch frame going up. If you're mounting this one on a pole or this one, Sometimes folks like to see things that are aesthetically pleasing to them. The birds aren't going to be concerned with the appearance. The birds are looking for this cavity okay. here. Yeah. So you can mount it on a pole 5 to 10 feet high. Or if you're doing the larger birds, you can mount it on a pole or a tree trunk 10 to 30 feet high. But you want to see what's going to make a good house. And just as when we're looking for a house, there are certain things that we're looking for that's for right. our families. The birds are looking for a house that's going to have thick enough wood for insulation. They want a house that is going to be easy to open. This one happens to have two ways to open. You can view from the top or you can clean out on this one from the side. Nice. Cleaning out is very important okay. because if you don't clean out after each brood, remember the story of the princess in the pea and the mattresses getting higher? Pretty soon, after maybe four broods, three broods this summer, the nestlings would be right at the top uh -huh. and it would be easy for predators to grab them out. Okay. So you want to be able to clean out. What, you would, want, you, what would you use to clean it out with? Uh, you could use a stiff brush, okay. garden hose. Birds aren't clean. They don't clean up <laughs> after themselves. Although the parent does take the fecal sac every time and fly off with it. Huh. But there might be some whitewash in there you want to clean off sure. with a stiff brush and maybe some vinegar water. Okay, vinegar yeah. water. Huh. Also, you want to have drainage. A good house is going to have either corner cuts or holes in the bottom. So when the rains come, you're not sitting in a wet mattress or a wet nest. <laughs> this one has a slight overhang. This other one has even more so. And that's to prevent the rains from blowing in. And that'll help to keep them drier as well. This one also has that round circle on the front. And that's to prevent predators from reaching in and taking a nestling. Yeah. Mortality rate in birds is very high. Spring is a very fun time of the year in summer to watch birds raise their young. Uh, it's probably the best of nature, mm. but it's also the worst of nature mm. because you see so many nestlings that don't survive. If you have an existing house that's just flat across the front, you can add a block of wood to the front with the same size opening and that would make the reach farther in for your predators to get in. Or if you have squirrels that think that it's a house for them, <laughs> or woodpeckers are making the entrance too big, you can add a metal ring to it and that'll that. prevent them from, from entering into it. So if you do put up a house, make sure that you're targeting the species that is in your habitat. For okay. instance, if you live in the heart of the city, and you want bluebirds, I'm sorry, you it's probably won't get them. Okay. But if you live in an area that's more open, uh, like a park setting or a golf course, or has open field with just a few trees, yes, you could possibly have our eastern bluebirds who are year-round residents here, mounted on a pole, five feet up or higher. Uh, keep predators out. Predators can be raccoons, they can be snakes. Snakes, yeah, that's what I was thinking. So you want to put baffles on the pole and you want to put predator guards onto your house. Be patient. It might take a while to get a response. If nobody comes within two seasons, move your house okay. to a different area. Okay. And uh, try not to use pesticides because many of these birds are going to use insects for their nestlings. 
which brings me to if you want to try to attract nesting birds, provide live mealworms as a food source in your yard and always have water. But just put your house up, sit back and enjoy. Oh, and I forgot to mention one thing. Keep your house away from your bird feeders. Okay. Birds like privacy and they don't like all that activity of the other birds. So just have a good time with it. Have a good time with the birds. That's right. In the bird houses. Thank you, Ms. Debbie. We appreciate that. You're welcome. That. Thank good information. you. There are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you. All right, Mr. D, so you're going to demonstrate to us how to use one of these live animal traps, right? How to catch a raccoon or a <laughs> possum or some any critter that's causing you some trouble. What I have here is, a, I guess it's a have a heart live animal trap okay. or, or, or a very simple construction. Uh, this one's big enough. This one has actually caught several raccoons in its life. <laughs> uh, to open it up, you release the screen right here and just open the door and then you hold it and you see the little flap mm -hmm. oh okay that will release the door when something steps on that flap so we, the hook we have a lever that comes up here let me turn it around where you can see that that flap is attached to this hook which is attached to the door. Mm -hmm. So if I set the hook like that and release it, the trap is set. Okay, I got you. So if you run in there and, and uh, you know, you're gonna be caught. So I'm gonna put some bait and, and <laughs> one of the preferred baits for raccoons is tuna. Huh. So I have a can of tuna fish over here. So I'm gonna grab this. I'm not gonna trust the hook right now. Make sure I hold the door open with one hand this is my trusty can of tuna fish. All right. Pretty good. Yeah. I'm going to set that. It smells good. Back huh? behind, behind the, uh, the uh, little trigger. And now I'm going to reset my hook, release the pressure. So the trap is loaded. Ready to go. Grab the handle here. See how that trigger's yeah, set? I see it. Huh. So it's loaded, it's ready to go. Now, I'm gonna set it in an area here that uh, I'm gonna kind of back it up because I don't want critters coming to the outside and trying to reach in okay. to get it because they can accidentally trip the, the trigger. I'm gonna push it back into a kind of a protected area here where hopefully the critters will uh, just come through the front door. They'll, they'll, they'll see that's the only door that's open. I'm sliding it back here. Hey, watch that poison ivy down there. Yeah, now. there's a little bit of poison ivy there. Now, before I put the bait in there, I pull some out and I stored it on this little ash leaf. Yeah, ash leaf. And to try to entice the critters, I'm going to scatter a little tuna around here, <laughs> outside. Just a little bit out here. Get their, uh, get their interest up. I'm getting closer to the door. Right at the front door there. Now I'm going to come around. And come in over the top. Drop some in through the top. Oh, okay. A couple, couple of little teaspoons of that there. A little bit more, getting closer. To catch a raccoon, you got to be sneakier than a raccoon. <laughs> <you know? laughs> 
<laughs> a little bit closer. I have a hunch you've done this before, right? I have. Uh huh. Were you successful? Several times. Several times, he says. <laughs> I even put a little bit on the trigger there. And let me lay my little leaf right there. We'll save our spoon for next go round. Okay. But I uh, need to come back and check your trap at least every 36 hours. Mm. And uh, when you uh, catch the critter, again, be, contact the, or check TWRA's website and they will tell you what you can and can't do with a trapped animal. Yeah. Um, or, or <laughs> contact your local game warden. <laughs> Uh, I know that you can't transport these animals because there's a possibility that you could spread diseases. So if you think about catching a raccoon and driving it out to Shelby Farms and turning it yeah. loose, unless you have a permit to do that and are licensed to do that, you'll be breaking the law. So you can't do that. Can't do that. No. Not legally. Not legally. Right. Um, and I've got a feeling that uh, if these critters are causing you problems, the game officer is going to t tell you to destroy the critter, you know, wow. dispatch him, wow. which is what I would do. Is dispatch him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm sure you would do that, right? Exactly right. <laughs> All right, well, do appreciate that demonstration there, Mr. D. And hopefully, 36 hours or so, we have something caught. Maybe quicker than that. Maybe quicker than that. Mm. All right. You never know. You never know. Trapping is, uh, you know, some folks are better trappers than others. and, and, and uh, you know, there's things to consider. You, you probably don't need to, if you, you handle that trap with your bare Man, hands, yeah. probably need to use gloves okay. or rubber gloves or, or something that'll uh, prevent the human scent. Probably don't need to walk around here a lot, yeah. you know, uh, uh, because they're pretty pretty crafty. Wow. But we'll see. All right, we'll see what we get. Thanks, Mr. D. Oh, most welcome. All right. Over a period of time, you have dead grass, leaves, and blip in your soil. We call that thatch, and thatch is dead grass in your soil. And every now and then you need to get that out of there for the water and stuff can penetrate down to the root system. And you can use like a, a little garden rake there, especially if you got a small area, you can use a garden rake. And you just want to get in here real good, and that rake cross, then get all that dead grass out of there. And let me say, you see that, you know, that dead grass coming out of there? You get, now you see, the, you see the green grass begin to show through there when you got all that dead grass out of there. So when you get it out of there, and this be really good compost material when you get through to put into your compost bin. It'll rot and decay. You can use it, you can use it in your flower bed. This is dead grass, leaves, and all, all the stuff to build up in your soil over a period of time. And you can just take this here, look at all that there just came out of there. You can take this here and put it in your compost bag, and this be good material. So this is just a short tip on how to remove that from your lung. All right, this is our Q&A session. And Ms. Debbie, you have anything to add to it? Please do. Thank All right, you. here's our first viewer email. I have brown circular rings showing up on my Bermuda lawn. Any idea what that could be, Mr. D? Fairy rings, probably. I thought fairy rings. Uh, I, I thought possibly spring dead spot. Spring dead spot. I wonder how big the rings are. Yeah, it would be good if we had a picture. Yeah. Yeah. With spring dead spot, there are fungicides that can help you. Right. And with right. fairy ring, there's really no, mm -hmm. nothing that you can do about it. Mm -hmm. So. Two different problems. Yeah, spring dead spot pretty much, you know, it's a fungus that attacks in the fall and the winter of the year. Uh, if you have soil compaction, if you have a lot of thatch, if you have poor drainage, then you're pretty much going to have a fungal disease, yeah. which would be spring dead spot. Mm -hmm. And uh, usually you see it during the, you know, the green transition period. You know, everybody else's grass is coming in real nice, and then yours, it happens to be a little ring there. Uh, it's tan grass. Uh, it lets you know that, hey, it's a fungus. Yeah. But yeah, you can use uh, fungicide or some of your cultural practices. Soil fertility is something else. Important. That's important too. Oh. So yeah, fairy ring or spring dead spot is what I'm thinking. Yeah. Okay. All right, here's our next question. And guess what, y'all? This is a paper letter. So people are still writing. That's good. Yes. All right, so this is for family, uh, family plot. I would like to know what to do to keep squirrels from eating my tomatoes. Yours truly, Miss Joyce, right here in Memphis. So she would like to know what to do to keep squirrels from eating her tomatoes. Don't we all want to know? 
<laughs> how to keep the squirrels away from eating out tomatoes, Miss David. Don't we all know that? All right, Mr. V. He's Twelve shaking his head. Uh-oh. Twelve-year-old with a 20-gauge <laughs> shotgun. That's all I can say. <laughs> and and let, me, let me preface that by saying check with your local game officer and make sure it's legal. And hunting season needs to be open. But I, I, there, there is a – University of Tennessee has a, a uh, very, very nice publication. If I can find a copy of it, the front page – that I would suggest that you take a look at, uh, but it's, and I don't see it here. I'll find it here in a minute. It is, uh, uh, there you are, okay. Managing yeah. Nuisance mm -hmm. Animals Around the Home. And I'm going to read a quote <laughs> okay. from this publication. Okay. <laughs> and also go to TWRA's website, mm -hmm. Tennessee Wildlife Resource That's Agency's good. website, and if you explore that, there will, there will be a section, uh, if you look into, that tells you how to control critters, yeah. unwanted critters around the home, and talk to you a little bit about the laws and all that. So I encourage you to do that <laughs> before I read this quote. All right. This is from page, the quote. page 12, <laughs> UT Extensions, Managing Nuisance Animals and Associated Damage Around the Home. <laughs> Top of page 12, without question. Shooting is the most effective method oh, no. of eliminating troublesome squirrels when local regulations or game laws permit. Oh, boy. Now, you know, <laughs> with that being said, um, you might try uh, naphthalene mothballs, moth crystals, scatter, mm. scatter them around. That might give you some temporary relief. Temporary. Temporary oh, relief. Man. Shooting is more permanent. <laughs> Shooting is more permanent. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, it's just there's not, not, lot, not a lot of things you can do. If you've got a lot of squirrels, you plant a lot of tomatoes. That way yeah. maybe you'll Share. have enough tomatoes for you yeah. and the squirrel. Share. Yeah. But it's not anything at all unusual when you, as your tomatoes are getting ripe. You know, you want a good vine ripened tomato, nothing yeah. like a homegrown tomato. Oh, sure. But it's not anything at all unusual to step out there and the day before you're going to pick that tomato, see the squirrel running mm -hmm. across the yard with your tomato in his mouth. <laughs> right. You know. And, you're exactly uh, right. That's where the 12 year old with the 20 gauge would come in. <laughs> oh, be careful, Miss Debbie. <laughs> I know. I have to warn all the squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> be careful. All right, there you have it, Miss Joyce. Uh, Good publication, though. That is a real good publication. It is. Yes, it, it talks to a lot of critters, a lot of critters. Yeah, real good. All right, here's our next viewer email. Any suggestions for dealing with the rose rosette disease? Have you heard of that? We had it on ours at the <gasps> shop okay. a number of years ago, and all the master gardeners that shopped with us mm -hmm. came in and told me, dig them up. Get rid of them. <laughs> Boy, those master gardeners are good. They are. Yes, no, yes they told yes, you the they... correct way of getting rid of those roses. Very good advice. And Very I'm actually advice. glad we did because that's, I referred to earlier in our conversation that we replaced it with milkweed mm. and lantana. Good. So it, it worked out well for us. Good for you. Good for you. Yeah, rose rosette, hey, you know the symptoms, excessive thorniness, the elongation of the shoots, the witch's broom, mm -hmm. you know, cluster of shoots. Mm -hmm. uh, it has those, what, uh, the, the red discolorations, red discoloration, you know, on those yeah. shoots. First thing you say. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Stunted growth, you know, stunted leaves, distorted leaves. Get it out. Take them out. Take them out. Because it's spread by the, uh, the aerophyte mite. Right. You know, it's what it is. Um, you know, it gets, you know, on that plant material. That's it. If you leave one bad one in there, yeah. it can affect all of them. That's right. Get them out quick. That's right. I mean, there are going to be some experiments going on. Uh, Dr. Wyndham, you know Dr. Wyndham mm -hmm. up at Nashville, uh, our pathologist, they're actually working on, you know, some experiments with Rose Rosette. So hopefully we'll find out more in the future about what to do. But for right now, the recommendation, pull them out. Are there any roses uh, that are resistant to Rose Rosette that you know of? Not that I know of. Mm -hmm. Not that I know of. Because, you know, once upon a time, it's like, oh, knockout roses won't get Rose Rosette. Well, we've actually mm -hmm. seen they a will. couple of cases yeah, uh, where they came down with Rose Rosette. Mm -hmm. So, get them out. Yeah. Get them out. I grow roses at home, and last year I got rid of three rose bushes that, has rose rosette, that had rose rosette. Uh -huh. So, yeah, get them out. And as Mr. D would say, double bag them. Don't, yeah, don't mulch them up and put them in no. your yard, you know, in your landscape. Throw them in the trash. Get rid of them. All right, Miss Debbie, Mr. D, we're out of time. Huh. Deal. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplots at wkno.org. 
and the mailing address is Family Plot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. To get more information on things we talked about on today's show, go to familyplotgarden.com. You can also watch videos from past shows. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by Goodwin's Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation The WKNO Production Fund The WKNO Endowment Fund and by viewers like you. Thank you.